It's spring, plant friends. Finally, as we have patiently, if you're in the Northeast, been waiting for the cloak of winter snow to lift. We're here. We're in spring. And that means spring cleaning. When you hear spring cleaning, you think about moving your couch and sweeping behind it, going through your closet and pulling out the clothes that you don't want, doing a deep clean of your kitchen cabinets and your kitchen countertops. But today's episode is focused on spring cleaning, but for your houseplants. In the spring, as your plants go into a new season, there is a list of things that you can do to set your plants up for success for their best growing season yet. And today I will be giving you a checklist of things to do. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Hello, hello. Welcome back, my sweet plant friends. Welcome back if you're a recurring listener, and thank you. I love you. And if you're new, hi. Welcome to the Growing Joy Podcast. I'm Maria. I'm so excited to have you here today for a solo episode on my spring houseplant care checklist. This checklist is good because it's not filled with, for lack of a better word, like bullshit things that people say that you should do on the internet and then not do. This checklist is literally all of the things that I did this month for my collection, making sure that you're doing it as well so that you can set yourself up for success this summer. A lot of our houseplants have been dormant. A lot of our houseplants have been in a state of quiescence. They've just kind of like slowed down and been chilling out as there's been less light, as there's been cold snaps, right? And um, this is a beautiful opportunity to awaken ourselves. But as this is the Growing Joy podcast, and I want to talk to you about how to care for plants successfully, but also how to cultivate joy while doing so, throughout this checklist, I'm also going to encourage you to see your plant life parallels and realize there's our houseplant spring, but then there's our internal spring. And what can we be doing for ourselves as well to kind of do a little spring cleaning? I just finished a weekend of spring cleaning in my house. I swept behind every piece of furniture. I dust bustered the corners. I, you know, scrubbed the countertops. I have a baby bird. So I like did a thorough clean of my office, swept up and vacuumed all the seeds that are scattered all over my office now that I'm a bird mom. And I got to tell you, plant friends, it feels so good. Spring cleaning feels so good. And as I've been doing these little rituals with my houseplants, it's felt so good too. It feels like a way to really connect with our inner nurturer. And it's a very gentle practice. And I think in a world that feels like it's on fire sometimes to experience gentleness is really nice. And so I hope that this checklist helps you connect with your inner nurturer, helps you kind of plant positivity and weed what isn't serving you anymore. Life moves so fast that sometimes you need the act of houseplant maintenance or spring cleaning to kind of drop you back into the present and see where you're really at. Some people say that, you know, the state of their house is a reflection of their mental health. And I also very much believe the state of our plants is a reflection of mental health. So without further ado, like, let's just dive in. It's just you and me today, no guests. So I am excited to walk you through understanding what's going on in this change of season, like physically that our plants are experiencing, and then how to kind of capitalize on this. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully. 
just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend, go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend, go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. So number one on your checklist is understanding how the change in daylight is going to affect your change in care. So if we think about it in winter, the days get shorter, there's less light availability. It can also get colder, but plants use light to make food. So if there's less light, they're making less food and they're probably slowing down. The beauty of the spring equinox is, which happened a couple of weeks ago, is that all of a sudden the days are the same amount of length. And then as we move into spring, into summer, the days get longer. More light equals more food for plants because photosynthesis is how they make that, equals more growth, equals, you know, the plants tumbling down our bookshelf, the lush Hoya, the blooms, everything we want normally comes in the spring and summer because of that light availability. Light is the most important thing for plants. So with this change in daylight, we want to capitalize on that and set our plants up for success here. So a couple of things to think about. Number one, with watering. So you normally see, if you look at like general blogs on the internet, you see reduce your watering in the winter and then increase your watering in the spring. And as a rule of thumb, yes, that makes sense, right? Because as the plants are photosynthesizing more, they're going to need more water for that process. So in general, you're going to want to keep your eyes on your plants because they might be getting thirstier faster. That's in general. This is also where I say, okay, we all have different environments for our plants and for ourselves. And because of that, everybody's individual scenario is going to be a little bit different. So I say you have to kind of become a super sleuth to make sure that this general plant care advice that you see on the internet actually applies to you. A great example is for me in my house, I have a hygrometer in my office right now. I have a humidifier running and it's like 21% humidity. It's like 14% humidity in my house. In the winter, I actually have to increase my watering because my house is so dry And we have these base floorboard heaters, and my plants are near those floorboard heaters. It dries the soil out so quickly that I end up watering more in the winter and less in the spring-summer because of that. So that's just an example that the general care guides don't actually apply to me. And yes, you can take these general pieces of advice to heart, but always know that you are empowered to make your own choices about your own plants. If you have plants under grow lights, they're not going to be affected by spring as much because your grow lights are probably on a 10 or 12 hour cycle being on every day. So there's no need for you to increase your watering if your plants are under grow lights because they're kind of, they've been in this simulated spring summer all year round. So every time the season changes, it's a great opportunity to just tune into your plants and pay a little bit more attention to them as they go through this change to realize whether or not they need extra or less support. In general, with watering, you know, your fingertip is going to be the best (laughs) way to really understand if your plant needs more water. Don't water wet soil. If the pot hasn't dried out, don't water it. And also in my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, I talk about using that putting your finger in the soil as an opportunity to have a mindful moment. 
a lot of us, and I'm guilty of this, you know, when I'm checking for watering, I just like jam my finger into the soil to see if it's dry or if it's wet and then water. But can you like take a deep breath, put your finger on the soil, feel the soil between your two fingers, feel that like tactile experience of engaging with the soil. Think about like all of the incredible activity going on in that soil, right? The water, the nutrients, the things that are helping support your plant to grow and bloom and have like a moment of appreciation instead of just this like going through the motions of checking if the soil is wet. Okay, I digress. So that's watering. More light equals more photosynthesis. This is something that I do every year for spring cleaning, but also mostly for my houseplants. I actually wipe all of my windows down. As we know that there's more volume of light that our plants are getting, we want to make sure that our plants actually get that light and dirty windows act almost as a veil to that light. So washing your windows from the inside, wiping them down is a great way to make sure that your windows are as clean as possible so the sun can access your plants. You would be shocked throughout the winter of all of the dust that accumulates on your windows. You think spring, summer, that's when they get dirty, but man, in the winter, I just wash down all my windows and the dust from, I think, our heaters and our just ventilation, the windows were filthy. So it felt also that's just like a really fun process of seeing a dirty window and wiping it down like you feel so good after doing it so anyway wipe down your windows to ensure that your plants are getting the most sun there's more light availability so you know a lot of people in the winter put their plants up against the windowsill in the winter to capture whatever sun is available in the winter you might have to move your plants out of your windowsills if they are sensitive be mindful of burn so as there becomes more light availability. This is where some plants might potentially get burned if they're in your windowsill, if they're touching the glass. So just be mindful of this. I mean, you know your plants, but I've definitely heard of stories that, you know, you buy a plant in the winter, you put it in your windowsill. It's like a medium light plant. Then the sun gets super strong in the spring and summer, and then the leaves start to get burned. So you'll notice your plant is getting burned if you see the leaves browning, especially if like only half of the plant browns and it's the half that is up against the window or facing the window. So just be mindful if you need to like move your plants towards the sunlight or away from the sunlight and kind of just play with it. Obviously, in the beginning of spring, you're not going to see that effect as much, but just keep your eyes peeled as we kind of go through this checklist of what's happening and then what we should be knowing moving right along. So that's understanding more light availability is here for our plants. That light is going to help our plants make food and grow. We've got to respond to that. Mind your temperatures. This is very important in the winter, obviously, when it gets cold and we have to kind of accommodate for that. But also mind in the spring. In the winter, we have to battle heaters. In the summer, we have to battle air conditioners. Even though it's hot in your house, if your plants are right next to an air conditioner that's blowing freezing cold air, that could shock your plants, right? In my old apartment, some of our plants were right on top of our air conditioner and I realized that some of them were really unhappy because they were like positioned so that the air was blowing on them. So mind your AC. Also in the beginnings of spring, there can still be drastic changes in weather. You know, especially in New York, you have one day where it's like 65 degrees and sunny and another day where it's 40, you know. My birthday is actually this week, it's April 10th and there's been snow on my birthday and there's been like 70 degree days on my birthday in New York. So you never know what you're going to get. So be mindful. And that actually piggybacks onto my next tip. Open your windows on your nice days and get some fresh air circulating in your house. That will probably immediately increase the humidity in your house. If you're like me and you have such a dry indoor environment, opening your window and letting that naturally more humid air in, especially in the spring as it rains so much, get some clean, fresh air circulating. But along those lines, too, if you do open your window, just be mindful of closing it at night if it gets really cold. You don't want to shock your plants. So just make sure that if, you know, you mindfully open a window, you mindfully close it again before it gets cold at night or if there's another cold snap. So you just want to be mindful of the fluctuation in temperature because houseplants like to be between 65 and 80 degrees. Nothing lower, nothing higher, if you can. Also, I just wanted to say a quick shout out to our Australian listeners. I'm sorry that I'm releasing this episode, obviously, in my springtime, right? But I know you guys are enjoying your summer into winter. So we've got a fall episode, too, that you can go back and listen to. But we have a large amount of Australian listeners, and I just wanted to shout out, and I love you guys. All right, now let's get into the spring cleaning, right? So spring cleaning with our houses, we're sweeping, we're mopping, we're scrubbing. 
we're editing, we're donating, we're recycling, we're going to do that with our houseplants as well. So it's totally normal in the winter for your houseplants to get yellow leaves, to get brown leaves as they experience quiescence, a quieting with their lack of sunlight. And some of them go dormant, they go to sleep. Some of them just kind of slow down. And so this is a great time to check in with your whole plant collection. And I do recommend doing this checklist in like a two-hour span with your plants because you can really just like tune into your collection. You know, you can listen to this podcast, but like don't watch TV, like really spend some mindful time with your plants. So this is a time to go through your whole plant collection, prune back your brown and yellow leaves. The plant has reabsorbed the green chlorophyll back into the plant. Those brown and yellow leaves are useless to your plant and your plant doesn't need to waste time trying to sustain them. So start fresh, prune back the brown and yellow leaves on all of your plants. What I like to do is I like save all the brown and yellow leaves of that epic prune day and I just like keep them in a little pile. I like to take a photo of them because I think it looks cool, but also I just kind of thank them before I compost them in my loamy. If your plant has gotten leggy in the winter, leggy meaning it is stretching for the sun, you'll notice the internodes, the nodes are where the leaves pop out of the plant. If they've gotten longer, like if there's a portion of your plant stem that has the leaves are much closer together, and then there's a portion of your plant, like the top of your plant, where the leaves are much farther, that's the plant getting leggy. It's the plant stretching, trying to look for light. Feel free to prune that back. If your plant has gotten too leggy, with most plants, when you prune the top of a plant, it actually triggers the release of a growth hormone that instigates more bushier growth. So if your plants are looking like not so happy, you can prune like a third to, you know, a half of the plant back and that will inspire more growth to come in. I obviously like this concept of pruning the top of the plant to trigger this growth hormone because it's interesting to know the the physiology of what's happening in your plant. But this is actually one of the most potent plant life metaphors that I've ever encountered in my five years of being a plant parent. Pruning back to instigate growth. And I think in a time of spring cleaning, this is like a great time to think about this. Sometimes you have to prune in order to make space for bushier, lusher, amazing growth to allow that plant to become a more fully expressed version of itself. And I think this concept really applies to us as well. What areas in our life, as we are in the state of spring cleaning, Could we look at and think, huh, maybe I need to remove a toxic friend who I'm spending too much time with, and maybe in clearing that toxic friend out of my life, I'm going to invite new friends in, right, that are more sustaining, more more enriching relationships. Maybe there's like a negative thought pattern that really hasn't been serving me that's kept me leggy and limp and awkward. And maybe it's time for me to like prune that mindset off to allow a shift. Maybe there's a bad habit that I've had for a while that definitely is not serving me, that it's time for me to really release so that I can replace it with new habits and kind of grow into a better version of myself. This was a very potent metaphor for me in the pandemic when I know you all know my story, but I lost my job. I had to cancel my wedding. I had to move back in with my parents. And man, I just kept saying to myself over and over again, prune back to inspire growth, prune back to inspire growth. Like I had to just trust that this massive prune in my life, my job, my home, my wedding was being done for some reason that I couldn't quite see yet. I couldn't see the growth. The buds hadn't formed, but I just had to trust that it was happening. That was totally my mantra for 2020 and 2021. And it worked out. Here I am chatting with you, right? Anyway, that was another plant life parallel for you. But anyway, prune your plants. (laughs) This is also a great opportunity to clean your leaves. So your leaves are like little magnets for dust particles. And in the winter, when our ventilation is blowing dust all over our house, dust tends to settle on your leaves. So there's a couple of ways that you can clean your leaves. If you have like a monstera or a plant that doesn't have that many leaves and they're big leaves, you can take just like a microfiber cloth or an old rag dampen it with just plain water and wipe all of the plants down. It feels so nice. (laughs) It's kind of like cleaning those windows. It's like something that you feel very good about after, but it's a really kind of intimate moment with your plants that I really enjoy as well. 
If you have plants that have really small leaves, or if you have a really large collection that you're like, I do not want to wipe every single leaf of my entire collection down, what I do once a quarter is put my plants in the shower. And they take a little shower. They take a little bath. I put on a bathing suit. (laughs) And I put my plants in the shower, and I rinse everyone down. This is also a great opportunity that if there are some bugs, like insect pests that are hiding – If you're going to physically wipe each leaf down, that's going to be the opportunity for you to see, oh my God, I this plant has scale and I didn't even notice. Or wow, there's webbing in the armpit of the plant. Like this is probably spider mites and then be able to treat. But when you give it a rain shower in your shower, it really also is an opportunity to knock off any pests with that force of the of the shower head. And also you might have underwatered a plant once or twice in the winter. And I love just like a good soaking, right? If you think about watering a plant, trying to mimic what happens outdoors, our plants get watered by epic rainfall. They get saturated. Their ground gets saturated before it dries out. So I like once a quarter really making sure that my plant's soil has not become hydrophobic, meaning it's gotten so dry that it can't even absorb the water. Giving it a really good soak just allows that soil to like fully saturate again and kind of prep to be receptive to the more water that you're going to be watering your plants with. So clean your leaves by either dusting, wiping manually, or take a shower with them. Some people also, and this is uh, something that I've done this year because I had my first mites outbreak. I'm very lucky that I've only dealt with scale in my collection and spider mites once, but actually, no, I have white flies on my Hoya. I'm also going to spray them down. So once I give them a shower, in the shower, I spray them down with a Spoma's insect spray. They have like an insect repellent spray that's organic. So I spray them all down with that spray and just kind of let it dry before I put them back. So they have this coating as a preventative measure for spring when if we start opening our windows and stuff, there might be more pests that come in. I'm so excited to welcome our newest sponsor to Growing Joy, Sakara, my new favorite healthy meal provider. Sakara delivers science backed, plant rich nutrition programs and wellness essentials right to your door. They're amazing. Their ready to eat meals are nutritionally designed to deliver results from weight management and eased bloat to boosted energy and clearer skin. I just finished their three-day program and I feel incredible. If you've been following my health journey on social media, you know that I'm taking control of my physical health this year after gaining 40 pounds in the pandemic and struggling with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Last year, I took care of my mental health. This year, I'm taking care of my physical health. I'm making a conscious effort to make healthy choices for my body. But I'm also a foodie, so I can't just be eating bland salads. That's not going to work for me. I need my food to taste good. Sakara and their nutrient-packed and delicious meals delivered to my door were the perfect way to kick off this lifestyle shift I'm making. Like I said, I just finished their three-day program and Plant Friends. This food was so delicious. I was kind of shocked. I knew it was going to be good, but I didn't realize it would be this good. They send you three days of healthy meals to your doorstep. You pop them in the fridge. You don't even need to heat them up, but I did. And man, after the three days, I really feel a noticeable shift in my body. And because I feel so good, it's helping me continue to make healthy choices as I have finished the program. Although I could totally see myself reordering. If you follow me on Instagram stories, you probably watched me doing the three-day program. I shared the different foods in my stories, and I joked that they have some sort of freaky magic in their food because every meal was so delicious and thoughtfully designed, nutrient-dense, the perfect balance of plants, proteins, and fats. I am dreaming about their mango tapioca pudding that I had for breakfast one day, and their roasted peach chana masala for dinner was so good. Billy was jealous of that one. If you're feeling called to add easy, healthy food into your life or you need a quick reset as we move into spring, but you need some support, I have such an exciting offer for you. Right now, Saqqara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order. That's crazy. When you go to saqqara.com slash growing joy or enter the code growing joy at checkout at saqqara.com. That's Sakara S A K A R A dot com slash growing joy to get twenty percent off your first order. You will not regret it. The food is so delicious, you're gonna feel so good after it. So once again, that's Sakara dot com slash growing joy. In an episode about spring houseplant prep, I've gotta tell you about the products that I use 
for my houseplants every day, and they're all from Espoma Organic. Espoma Organic is a longtime friend of the podcast. I hope you know that they're a 90-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. So the first Espoma product of theirs that I found, which was like five years ago now at this point, was a bottle of their liquid indoor houseplant food. Summer Rain Oaks had gifted it to me. And before then, I didn't really fertilize my houseplants because I didn't like the mess it made. And I didn't like that I had to use outdoor fertilizer and like calculate a lesser strength for my houseplants. It just really intimidated me. And Espoma's liquid indoor houseplant fertilizer was the answer to my prayers. It makes fertilizing so easy. All you have to do is measure the liquid into the cap of the bottle. You dump it into your watering can, and then you water your houseplants. It's that simple. And since it is that gentler recipe, there's no like cuckoo calculating in math and guessing that you have to do to make sure that you don't burn your houseplants. And then for potting mix, all of my houseplants are potted in Espoma's general potting mix. It's amazing. It's light. It's fluffy. It's great. Most of my tropicals are in it. And then if I want a chunkier mix, I mix some of their orchid mix into their general potting mix to make like a chunkier kind of aeroid mix if I'm feeling fancy. They also have a succulent cacti mix that I have limey and my limited amount of succulents in, but they really have a specific mix for most plants from cacti to African violets, orchids, even bonsai. So whatever you're growing, they've got your back. Plus, this family-owned company has a huge sustainability commitment, which is amazing. Their plant is 100% solar powered. They have zero waste manufacturing. They're eco-friendly. To learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I've curated a list of my favorite Espoma products for you. All right, back to the show. Time to refresh the soil if you need. So rule of thumb is that every one to two years, your plant probably needs a soil refresh. It doesn't necessarily need to be potted up into a larger pot, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but if you think about it, in nature, our plants have infinite amount of soil that their roots can grow horizontally to suck up the nutrients, right? Because we know that soil isn't plant food, plants use light to make their food, but soil has nutrients like nitrogen readily available when hit with water, the roots are able to absorb this nitrogen and other macro and micronutrients that the plant needs to sustain itself. And the beauty of being outside is that if a plant has kind of used all of the nutrients in its immediate area, the roots can just keep growing to find the nutrients that it needs. In a pot, that is not possible. Because the pot has a finite amount of potting mix that is jam-packed with delicious nutrients, but once the plant uses all those nutrients, it's much harder to get them because you have to fertilize regularly, and a lot of people forget to fertilize, and you want the plant to be potted in nutrient-rich potting mix so that it can absorb the nutrients every time the plant gets watered and not just like once in a blue moon when you fertilize. So for one of your spring cleaning checklist things, you can repot your plant or pot up your plant. There's difference, and I'll break it down for you. Repot, taking the plant out of its existing pot. The plant is not pot bound. You don't see roots swirling at the bottom. We'll go through all of the symptoms in a minute. All you're going to do is gently kind of shake off the old soil in that pot Put fresh potting mix into that pot that has all of the delicious nutrients that the plant needs, and then put that plant back in its original pot. It's happy in that pot. It doesn't need to be potted up, right? It just needs fresh soil so that it can absorb the new nutrients as that old soil didn't have enough nutrients anymore because the plant absorbed them all. As you're going through your plant collection and you're taking the plants out to check the roots, There will be some plants that have grown out of their pot. They've become pot-bound. Here are some symptoms of being pot-bound. Either you see roots growing out of the holes of the bottom of the pot. If you pull the plant out, you see roots starting to circle. If you have a circular planter, then you'll see roots growing in the circle that is the same shape of the planter. If you have a square planter, you're going to see roots growing in that square pattern, right? That means that the roots are looking for somewhere else to go, but they can't, so they just keep growing along the edges. If it looks like your plant is about to explode out of the pot, so if there are so many roots that actually they're pushing the plant out of the pot from the bottom, but it looks like the plant is like popping out of the top of the pot, that's another sign of being root-bound if roots are growing out of the top of the pot, obviously. So this means 
Your plant has grown a bunch of roots, it's blooming and growing, and it's time to pot it up. When you're potting up a plant, you're going to go for a pot that is about two inches larger than the existing pot. So if you have a plant in a four-inch pot, you're going to go for a six-inch. You are not going to take a plant in a four-inch pot and pot it up into a 10-inch pot because the issue there is then you're actually putting that plant in too much soil. The roots can't absorb all the water that the soil can hold, so the soil will stay wet and then the roots will rot. So you want to really just go two, maybe four inches if it's like a tremendously root-bound plant, but that's the rule of thumb for that. And so all you're going to do with that is you're going to take the plant out. If the roots are root-bound and they're growing in a certain pattern, squeeze the roots and shake them out of that pattern because even when you transplant them, they'll still grow in that pattern. So shake the roots, give them a, you know, give them a little massage. It's okay if you break a couple of roots, they're just going to keep growing. I had a teacher at New York Botanical Garden who used to say roots were made for breaking. And then you're going to put it in that new pot a little bit larger with fresh potting mix. This is a great process, definitely to do every one to two years, especially because if you've ever underwatered your plant and you let the soil dry out, it can become hydrophobic, meaning when you water the plant, the water just kind of skims over the side of the pot and it doesn't actually get absorbed by the soil because it's hydrophobic. The soil has become scared of the water. The way to treat that if you're noticing that you have, you know, you pull a plant out and the soil is like a rock, like a mass, you can just soak the soil before removing it. Or if you have a plant that has become hydrophobic, but you don't want to repot it, just stick that planter in a bowl of water with the holes in the planter at the bottom of it. And through capillary action, the plant will soak up the water and rehydrate. So bottom watering is a great way to rehydrate hydrophobic soil. All right. That was a long tangent about repotting, (laughs) but I feel like I've seen and heard from members of our community that they see these recommendations online that says you have to put your plants in a bigger pot every year, every two years. And that's not true. If your plant's roots haven't outgrown the pot, like you don't have to put it in a bigger plot. You just have to give it some new soil. So that's just an important distinction that I wanted to make sure that our community knows so they can grow joy and be happy. Okay. Next stop, fertilizing. So a rule of thumb you see on the internet a lot is fertilize in the spring, summer, and then don't fertilize in the winter. I don't love going by that. I like going by if your plant is growing, you should be fertilizing. If your plant is growing in the winter, you should fertilize it in the winter. If it's growing in the spring, summer, like most plants will, you should fertilize it then. So if you do do the practice that you don't fertilize in the winter, it is time now for you to start fertilizing as your plants you know, access more sunlight and will likely grow. But also just another rule of thumb is that I use a liquid houseplant fertilizer by Espoma that I just dump into my watering can and water my plants that way. There's multiple ways to fertilize. You can do the granules that you put on the top of the soil and they kind of release water every time you water. You could use a liquid houseplant fertilizer the way I do, or you can do a normal fertilizer that's geared for outdoor plants but you have to dilute it because houseplants don't need as much fertilizer as outdoor plants. They're more sensitive. So you have to dilute it. And I think you dilute it at about a half. So only use half of whatever the instructions say for your houseplant specifically. And I think that's all I have to say about fertilizing. But that is on your checklist. If you haven't been fertilizing, if you were like me, I never fer- I didn't fertilize my plants for like the first year and a half because I was too like intimidated by it. So if you've never fertilized your plants, this might be a fun invitation for you to start incorporating it into your plant care routine. Okay, I guess this is a checklist moment, but this is also more of a theory that I get a lot of questions about. So I wanted to talk about it. To move your plants outside or not to move your plants outside in the spring, summer. There are positives and negatives to moving your plants outside that I wanted to review, and then you can make the decision for yourself. But if this is something you want to do in the spring, I know a lot of people do. It's amazing. I've done it too. I wanted to make sure that you knew what you were doing. So this isn't a checklist thing that everybody has to do. This is an optional part of the checklist. But if you want to move your plants outside, this is what you need to know. You should not be moving your plants outside until your nights don't drop below 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Some people get into trouble when they move their plants outside when it's warm during the day, but in the spring, the nighttime temperatures still drop too low, so then their plants like freeze or get shocked at night. So you're not monitoring your daytime temperatures, you're monitoring your nighttime temperatures, and that's 65 degrees to be safe. If you're moving your plants outside, you also need to consider this concept called hardening off. If you're a gardener, you understand this, but when you're a gardener and you've started seeds indoors, 
you've started them in this like little gentle cocoon of your house that doesn't have winds and rainfall and your plants are sensitive. And so you have to do something called harden them off, which is basically you put them outside for a few hours, then you bring them back. You expose them, you bring them back. You know, you don't put them outside overnight until it's comfortable. So you kind of let them kind of figuratively like dip their toe in the water of being outside in nature. So this is what you're going to do with your houseplants. Because if you think about it, your houseplants have lived a really comfy life. They've been indoors. They've been temperature regulated. They maybe have a humidifier next to them. They're watered when they need to be. They've never been knocked over by wind. They've never had limbs knocked over unless you're clumsy like me, right? So it's very different than natural, you know, living outside is very different than living inside for houseplants. So number one thing you need to be mindful of is the sun. The sun outside is so much more powerful than the sun that you're getting inside. Even if you have southern facing windows, unobstructed view of the sun, the light that your plants are getting in that windowsill is so much less than the light that they're going to get outside. So as we're quote unquote hardening off our house plants when we move them outside, ideally you're moving them into the shade first and then you'll slowly introduce them to the sun if you want to put them in direct sunlight. Most of your house plants should thrive in the shade. They're not going to need direct sunlight, but if you have like a fiddly fig or a citrus tree. So when I had Limey, my citrus tree, who you know I've rehomed to Florida, what I would do is I'd put him in the shade on my parents' doorstep first, and I would put him in the shade, and I'd leave him outside during the day, and I'd bring him in at night, leave him outside during the day, bring him out at night, and then I would slowly just creep him towards more and more sun and towards a longer period of time being outside before being brought in until ultimately I was leaving him overnight when I made sure that the night wasn't going to be that cold. So you have to kind of slowly creep your plant's way into comfort. Another really important thing to know, if you are going to move your plants out in the springtime, know that you're setting yourself up to have work in the fall. When you bring your plants back, you must make sure that you manage for pests. Your plants are obviously going to contract pests if they're outside, beneficial or non-beneficial pests, right? There's bugs outside. Limey got scale every year that we put him outside, right? So I had to make sure that in the fall when I was bringing Limey back inside for for the winter, I was spraying him down with horticultural soap. I was giving him really sharp sprays with the hose to knock all the scale off. Then I was spraying him down in insecticidal soap. And then I was quarantining him for two weeks before I introduced him to my plants because I wanted to make sure that we eradicated any pests, any hitchhikers that came inside the house before I brought him back to my other plants so he didn't spread whatever he had to them. So just know that, you know, if you're going to do this in the spring, you've got to make sure that you're doing that in the fall. But this is a great practice. I know of a friend who had a fiddly fig. It was like a foot tall. She put it outside in New York City on her balcony, I think on her fire escape, and it grew. It doubled in size in one summer because once that fiddly fig gets the real bright light that it wants, it's going to shoot up, right? I put a Monstera out last year that probably like, I wouldn't say doubled in size, but probably grew a half of its size, right, in one summer. So it's a wonderful way to give your plants, you know, that sunny experience to soak up the light and enjoy, and houseplants make a gorgeous, you know, porch decoration. So definitely go and do it, but just know that you've got to harden them off and you've got to make sure that you're managing pests. And also when you bring them back inside, if they grow tremendously above the soil, they've also probably grown a lot of roots beneath the soil, so you might have to pot them up in a larger planter before you bring them back in. And I know that definitely happened with my Monsteras. And last but not least, this is not optional. (laughs) I gave you an optional one. And now the last bullet point on the checklist is use this as an opportunity to assess the state of your plant collection and as a chance to make changes if you need. So at this period of your life, how are you enjoying your plant collection? What plants are you the most drawn to? What plants have brought you more stress than joy? What plants... Make you smile every time you see them. What plants need to be potted up? What plants need to be pruned? And then kind of assess if there are plants in your collection that aren't bringing you joy anymore, that aren't serving you, make a plan. Maybe you can gift them to a friend that would love that plant. Maybe you can gift it to a local nursing home or hospital. Maybe you're in a situation where you're like, man, I'm loving my plants. I have a small collection. I'm actually ready to, you know, grow. And I'm feeling really drawn to adding Hoya to my collection, or I'm feeling really drawn to add a Monstera or to add some Aeroids. You know, you can get excited and make the plans, make your wish list of plants that you want to add to your collection. 
But this changing of the seasons, especially as we move into the spring 2023, just to me feels hopeful and using it as an opportunity to evaluate. You can get rid of plants that aren't serving you. You can make space for new ones, makes plans for upcoming house plant projects. I have gotten really into thrifting lately and I really want to thrift like a cool, I think they're called curio cabinets, but like the cabinets with the glass doors to make an Ikea grow frame thing, the thing that I've seen all over the internet. Maybe you want to make a potting shed. Maybe you want to redo your houseplant storage. Maybe you want to do a green wall. Maybe you want to make your own moss poles, right? Like take a minute and think like, what would get me jazzed? What would make me so excited this spring and summer? And then make plans to do that. So I just think like taking a general pause in this changing of season is so beautiful to really understand and remind yourself that you came to this hobby because of the joy it brought you and how can you amplify, how can you further amplify that joy? I talked about this a little bit, but I also think that while you're doing this, and you know my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, is all about how to use plant care as self-care. But man, the plant life parallels that we see in the checklist that I just gave you, right? You know, as you're pruning your yellow and dead leaves, what aspects of your life have yellowed or might be brown and you're ready to remove? While you're cleaning your plant's leaves, maybe you think about the aspects of your life that have kind of collected dust or maybe you're stagnant and need a little brushing off. While you're watering your plants and giving them that beautiful rain shower, are you fully hydrated? I mean, the simplicity of When I water my plants and I'm like, did I water myself today? Did I drink enough water today? Or have I only had coffee, right? And obviously also, what does my soul feel hydrated? Is there something that I could do that would make me feel really nourished and happy that I haven't been doing for myself? So I truly just think this plant care, self-care thing is just the best plant friends. And I think we should all use it. So I'd love to hear how you're going to be doing your spring houseplant checklist I'd love to see it on socials. Tag me if you end up going through the checklist and let me know what was fun for you, what wasn't, what you learned, what you caught maybe. Maybe you caught a pest outbreak. Maybe you caught, you know, a new baby of your Pilea peperomioides that you're going to gift someone. But let me know. My DMs are always open. I personally have just like so enjoyed the spring cleaning moment in my own home and with my own collection. As I was going through my plants this month, I realized that my entire Hoya collection in my office has white flies. <laughs> they came while I was gone in Florida for a month, and I've kind of been avoiding dealing with it for a week because I've been very busy. But I told myself that once I record this episode, I'm going to walk the walk and I'm going to take my entire Hoya collection into my bathroom. I'm going to give them a thorough water. I'm going to brush the white flies off, and then I'm going to go at it with insecticide and plant sprays because. My Hoya collection is in my office with me. It's actually behind me as I'm recording this. And my bird is also behind me. And I don't want the white flies to be bothering my bird. So also let me know if you want an episode on Frankie, my bird, because he's totally changed my life. I hope you've seen him on my social media. I hope this episode was helpful. We'll have a free download of the checklist and we'll have a thorough blog in the show notes. If you want to revisit it, don't feel like you have to listen to this episode 400 times to make sure you did the checklist. We'll make it very easy for you. Just click in the show notes. So thanks. I hope this spring brings you so much joy and so much peace. And I hope that your plants are a part of that. And I hope that your plants are a tool that you can use to cultivate so much joy and so much peace. And I am honored to be a part of your journey and to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural life 
Insight, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of Plant Friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. 
So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 